In the vast expanse of the Texas Plains, where the sun kissed the earth and the wind whispered ancient secrets, there lived a man whose name echoed through the canyons of history. His name was Quanah Parker, the last Comanche chief. Born of two worlds, Quanah grew up under the boundless sky, amidst the rolling prairies and the songs of his people. From his earliest days, he rode with the wind. But as the frontier expanded, casting its shadow across the horizon, Quana found himself caught between two worlds, the world of his ancestors and the world of the settlers who sought to tame the untamed West. Quana himself was born of these two worlds, born to a white settler mother, Cynthia Parker, and a Native American chief, Pita Nakona, gifted Quana with a heritage as rich and varied as the colors of the sunset. His mother's tale is almost as interesting as his. Cynthia Ann Parker was a woman caught between two worlds, a delicate thread woven between the tapestries of two cultures, two lives. Born into the heart of Texas, she knew the land like the lines on her own weathered hands, her spirit as wild and untamed as the prairies that stretched out before her. But fate had other plans for Cynthia Ann. In the shadow of a fateful day, her world shattered like glass, scattering fragments of her innocence to the winds of destiny. Captured by Comanche warriors in a raid on her family's homestead, she was torn from the embrace of her loved ones and thrust into a world that was as foreign as it was unforgiving. However, this entirely different world was one she grew to love and eventually die for. Cynthia was captured during what came to be known as the Fort Parker Massacre in 1836 where Comanche warriors attacked Fort Parker. And although she lived with her new family, the Comanche, for 24 years, her family and the Texas Rangers never stopped looking for her. They'd finally get their chance to take her back, but it wouldn't be the fairy tale ending you'd imagine. Now happily married to a Comanche chief with three children, her life would take a drastic and fatal turn. The Texas Rangers, who under immense pressure from Comanche raids in the Austin area, organized a counterattack. 40 rangers and 20 militia were tasked with putting an end to the constant raids. On the 19th of December, 1860, they came across Nakona's camp at Pease River. After a successful ambush and surprise attack, the Texas rangers would finally get their revenge. They slaughtered many natives and injured Nakona, while a young Kwana, his two siblings, and his mother attempted to flee. Kwana got away, but his mother and sister would be captured and taken back with the rangers. Her family was elated to find her safe, but what was once her home was now an alien way of life. Barely speaking their language and missing her family, who she presumed dead, she went into a deep depression with many accounts, noting that she often committed acts of self-harm. The final nail in the coffin came when her daughter died of illness, her believing her sons were most likely dead too. No longer had a reason to live and decided to commit suicide by voluntary starvation. A tragic end to a woman who was once a Comanche queen. Quana, now without a mother, lost his father shortly after the Battle of Pease River too. Some accounts state his father died in the raid itself, but Quana later reported that his father, although injured, survived for some time, but later died from his wounds. Now an orphan, a young Quana was taken under the wing of the new chief. As Quana Parker grew into a warrior, his life would be marked by many battles against the settlers. This was during the late 1800s, and after hundreds of years of struggle, the native culture was slowly being erased. After a long fight for his people's survival, it all came to a bloody end in 1873, when a Comanche, claiming to be a medicine man, called for the remaining warrior bands to unite and gather on the Red River, near present-day Texala, Oklahoma. The medicine man claimed he knew a ritual that would protect them in battle. Him, Quana and 250 warriors headed into Texas into battle. The battle should have been a slaughter, but the U.S. Army was forewarned and repelled the invaders. This led to drastic changes in policy toward the Comanche resulting in the Red River War, which would see many Plains Indians slaughtered and villages razed to the ground. Although Quana survived the coming battles, he saw defeat as imminent. Quana would eventually surrender in 1875 to the settlers, and was taken to Fort Sill, an Indian reservation. Although never elected chief by his people, 
the U.S. government appointed him the role, and unlike his father, who was chief of a small band of Comanches, he was made chief of the whole nation. With the help of Colonel McKenzie, Quanah Parker helped settle the remaining Comanche's Kiowa Comanche Apache Reservation in southwestern Indian Territory. President Roosevelt would often visit the territory and spend a lot of time with Parker, the two of them would often went on hunting trips. Although slowly assimilating into the settlers' way of life, Quanah rejected their religion and didn't obey all of their customs like monogamy. He even helped found the Native American church that blended ancient Native American rituals with Christian customs. Although still a Comanche at heart, he would slowly integrate into American society, and there would never be another Comanche chief. He spread the Native American church as much as he could and did his best to make the reservation as prosperous as possible. He would even act in some films like The Bank Robber, and due to his connections with powerful people like Chief McKenzie and President Roosevelt, became a famous name throughout the United States. Some critics called him a sellout for surrendering to the settlers and eventually adopting some of their ways like the clothing he wore. But to him, the survival of his people mattered most. And when he died at the age of 66 in 1911, he had still never lost a battle to the settlers and chose to carry the weight of his entire nation on his shoulders. This fascinating man's life is one that will be remembered for generations to come and will always be a key part in American history. In one lifetime, he went from living as people did in the Stone Ages to a statesman in the age of Industrial Revolution. He really did belong to two worlds and thrived in both. 